Good night, everyone. We're going to give folks a few minutes to log on. Please like and share because it's going to be a very, in, very informative talk this evening. Please like and share, like and share. Invite your friends. This evening we are speaking about penis health. Very important topic to many men and to many women. Giving folks a few minutes, two minutes to sign in. Welcome, welcome Shireen. Just a few more minutes, just two minutes to allow persons to join because I don't want you to miss not even an ounce of this message. Remind your friends that we're on at this time. <clears throat> Hi, Laura. Welcome. Okay, 901. Hi, Mercedes. Thanks for signing in. Okay, so let us start because we have a lot to fill into one hour. So once again, welcome to Boss Lady Live, coming to you from Totally Mail Limited. I am Sandra Samuel, CEO of Totally Mail. We have been um, grooming men for the past 25 years. This is the th third in the series of Boss Lady Live, um, and we were on um, <clears throat> Instagram Live, but we have now transferred over to Facebook Live. So I want to say welcome to Facebook Live, because we know we have a mature audience, and it's it's a lot of information, a lot of very important information that we we plan to disseminate from um, Boss Lady Live, um, especially to our men, but we do cater to women as well. We encourage you to uh, send in um, your messages, letting us know what you want to discuss, you know, especially when it comes to, you know, any male topics, because we, 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 we are totally male. We focus on the men, as you know, boys to men. So this evening, we are privileged to have join us Dr. William Aiken. He's a urologist, and he will tell you more, a little bit about himself um, so that you know that he's extremely qualified on this topic. And one of the reasons for me choosing this topic is that we, we have always had a lot of conversations, and, and men always talk about, you know, if, they're, if they, they don't, their pen, penis is not working, they'd rather die. So what we want and what we aim to achieve is that we want to encourage the men not to go when they're having a problem, but to seek the information before that happens. So tonight, uh, Dr. Aiken is going to give us a lot of information, and you can send in your questions um, via Facebook Live. We, I will field, field your questions to Dr. Aiken. So Dr. Aiken, welcome. Thanks again for Thank coming. You. And just tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and you know your field thank you sandra thank you for inviting me 
on your on the program and uh, good evening to all all the listeners so it's i'm very excited to share with you this evening about penile health it's a very very important topic because the state of health of the penis a lot of times reflect the general state of health of the man so i'm a consultant urologist i've been a urologist um, consultant urologist since 1998 i'm the first graduate of the dm urology program from the university of the west indies i was head of urology at the university for, for many years and quite a few urologists have graduated during my tenure and under my leadership I'm a past president of the Jamaica Urological Society and the Caribbean Urological Association. I just limited office as president of the Association of Surgeons in Jamaica. Hold on, hold on one second. <laughs> you're not seeing, oh, you're seeing now? Mr. Henry, you're seeing both of us? Yes, okay, go ahead. Sorry about that, yes. Bill. Sure. So most of my research interests are on prostate cancer. But as a urologist, of course, um, we see a lot of um, health issues related to the penis. And so um, caring for men who have issues um, related to um, their penile health is one of the things a urologist does. And so I think I'm qualified to speak on this subject. I they said they're not seeing I think they're seeing me from the phone. Um they're yeah. not seeing me from because we are live. You're, you're only seeing me. Oh uh, I can try connecting from my phone, Sandra, if that would help. You want me to connect from my phone? With the phone, it's that it it trips out. It because it's saying live. We are streaming live from um yard um stream yard, but it's not. They said they are not seeing. You are not centered, but doc is not visible. All right, let me. Oh. oh. All right, let me let me see something. Uh, I wonder if it's usurping. Doc is not visible. Hold on. Let 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 me. <clears throat> no, it's not. I think it's a hole. Ah. Why is it not coming up? Doc is not coming up. Hold on. My, ca my camera is on. Yeah, no, both of us are on. The thing is, uh, -huh. uh I am um, so I'm, 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 I think this is you surfing. So I'm on the left. I think you see the thing is I'm blind. I'm on a laptop. You want me to try from uh, my iPhone? Huh? Hold on. The thing is, I'm not seeing. Hold on one second. Because what is happening is that. Hold on one sec. Let us do this again. Hold on. Let me. Hold on. No, what is happening is that. When I'm streaming on the phone to get the questions, do, yes, but what is happening? Remember, you told me to um to to go on the phone, and so when I go on the phone to get the message, it overrides. Then I see, are you seeing us now? Yes. Are you seeing us now? All right. Let me end the bro So how am I going to get the questions? That's the problem. 
All right. Bill, I'm going to come. I'm going to end the broadcast and restart. Okay. 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 So rejoin then. Yes. Okay. Not a problem. Eh? Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. You see me now? You see both of us now? But it's, but it's, yeah, but it's not yet. Hold on. Are you seeing us now? Are you seeing us now, Shireen? But I'm not, I'm not getting the questions. That's a problem. I'm not going to be able to get the questions. So here what happened. I'm just going to have to go ahead. Maybe you'll have to just okay. steal me the questions because I'm not. All right. So sorry about that. Technical difficulties. And we went through this today. I'm going to, you just send, please send me the questions. So Sandra, could, could the questions be sent to a, a WhatsApp chat and or WhatsApp? Oh, yes. And, yes, and there's a WhatsApp so chat. Yes. Um, perhaps you could. Um, Folks, let us do this again. Let us start over because we're having technical difficulties. We're, we're working on, uh, on fine-tuning this. So let me just start over. My name is Sandra Samuel, CEO of Totally Mail. And we are coming to you live um, this evening. And we're speaking about penile. Let me get the, the, the correct term, penile health with Dr. William Aiken, and we are going to be fielding um, questions, and we're going to be giving you answers on your questions. If we are unable to do it now, we'll do it within, within the hour at some point. Dr. Aiken was just introducing himself. We were, we were told that you were not able to see him. Now you're able to see him. Please, um, Dr. Aiken, I, once again, thanks for coming on tonight to give us this very important information because, as I said to you earlier, a lot of men, you know, they have this thing, if their penis is not working, it's the end of the world. So what we want to do is to work more on the side of preventative measures rather than them coming to you when everything is going wrong. So let's, let us know, just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're qualified to um, be speaking to, to us tonight. Sure. Thank you, Sandra. And thank you for inviting me on, on your Facebook Live. So my name is William Aiken. I'm a consultant urologist at the University of the West Indies and former head of urology. I'm the first um, DM graduate from the urology program at the university um, over 20 years ago. Um, I have trained a number of urologists that, who work in the entire English-speaking Caribbean, and I'm a past president of both the Jamaica Urological Society and the Caribbean Urological Association. Um, I treat um, men who have issues um, related to the penis all the time. So this is an area that I believe I'm yeah, well in. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, so this evening we would just wanna um, speak about or start the conversation by just talking about health in general where men are concerned um, because we know that high blood pressure causes ED and stuff like that. So just give an overview, uh, um, re-health, where men are concerned. So when we think about health, Sandra, health is not merely the absence of, this, of disease, but health is considered a complete physical, mental, social, and indeed spiritual well-being. Right. And so, you know, the, the, the absence of disease is not good health. Good health relates to being in that place where you are, as the definition said, where you are in a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. The, the thing about the penile health or, or penis health is that very often the penis is a, is a when things go wrong with the penis, it, it is a local manifestation of 
a broader systemic problem taking place in the body. So for example, if a man has erectile dysfunction or inability to get a, a hard erection, very commonly that may result from an underlying problem, either with his blood pressure or he may be diabetic um, or he may have high cholesterol or he may have a low testosterone level or he may be having psychological or marital issues that is affecting his well-being. And so whenever somebody comes with a problem um, with the penis, it is not just simply a matter of focusing on the penis per se, but you have to focus on the general health, the, the both the physical, mental, social health of the patient to try and um, discern what is going on. Sometimes it is very easy to determine, for example, somebody may have a very tight foreskin, for example, what we call a phimosis. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that typically requires what is called a circumcision. But even in a case like that, sometimes you may pick up underlying disease such as diabetes, mellitus, or, or sugar, or sometimes the tight foreskin may lead to other problems such as infections um, occurring you know, on, under the foreskin and uh, affecting the head of the penis. So um, penile health is very much intertwined with the general health of the man. Mm -hmm. And as I said, very much, very often when things are going wrong with the penis, it, it is a barometer for the overall health of the patient. And, and that is usually when things are gone bad already. It's, it's, it's yes, it will require work at that point. So yes. I, I heard you mention um, the foreskin, circumcision. Circumcise or not to circumcise? Or, or if, if you are not circumcised, is there a problem with being, not being circumcised? No, so many, many decades ago, um, circumcision was um, used to be done far more routinely than it is now. And it is still done now for religious and cosmetic purposes. But we recognize that if a man daily retracts his foreskin and washes the area and dries it, then once he's able to do that, he's not at any risk um, for any problems. Uh, now, in places such as parts of Africa where the incidence of HIV is alarmingly high, the, the foreskin is a very efficient um, um, venue or for transmission of HIV. And so in, in, in high prevalence areas such as Africa, in circumcision, is is advocated but in countries such as jamaica where the prevalence of hiv is not that high um you know the, the advice to men is to daily retract their foreskin and wash the area thoroughly dry it and by doing that you you're you should be um, maintaining good health um of the head of the penis and the foreskin you said but you now, said something about it being tight so, right. so I mean, the what, what causes so, it to be tight? Okay, so if the foreskin becomes tight, um, due, usually due to scarring, and scarring may be result from a number of things. It may, for example, men who are diabetic, um, they have a higher incidence of getting scarring of the foreskin. And with each, with the scarring, when they try to retract the foreskin, tears in the foreskin may occur, which leads to further scarring. Um, sometimes um, young men may notice that their foreskin is not easily retracted. Mm -hmm. And because it's not easily retracted, um, they may have difficulty cleaning um, beneath the foreskin. And if that happens, there may be a buildup of what is called smegma, which is a combination of secretions um, stale urine, germs, um, which is what, which, which, if not dealt with, may lead to cancer um, of the head of the penis, wow. and it may, may also increase the risk of 
cancer of the cervix in the partner as well because human papilloma virus um, which which is the one of the etiologic or one of the causative agents of cancer of the cervix and penile cancer um, tends to live or thrive in that environment where you have a buildup of smegma and you, you can't, because you can't retract the foreskin. So in a situation like that, we would strongly um, urge a man to have his foreskin removed, which is called a circumcision. So that's one of the reasons why you do it, apart from cosmetic and religious reasons. Um, is, if the is, is there, is there, is it ever too late to get, uh, to get circumcised? No, well, so sometimes any risk um, also of circumcision sometimes circumcision? sometimes it may be too late from the point of view that a cancer may have already begun to develop and just doing a circumcision uh, may not be enough to cure the cancer you may have to remove either a part or 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 all of the penis to cure the, the person of cancer of the penis so in a situation like that, yes, it would be too late to do a circumcision. In terms of the risk of circumcision, um, a circumcision is, a, is an operation that is best done, best done by someone who is trained to do it, someone who does them often, um, because yes, there are risks um, in doing a circumcision. Um, there are cases in which um, the head of the penis uh, has sloughed off because of um, injudicious use of what we call diathermy, which is a form break that, of break that, down, break that down. Yeah. So, so sometimes when we're doing a circumcision, in order to stop bleeding, we use we use a uh, um, energy called diathermy, a diathermy current, which uses electrical energy mm -hmm. that allows you to cauterize vessels to stop bleeding. But if this is not used properly, you can literally um, you can literally cause the penis to to die because the diathermy can affect the blood supply to the penis. So I just mentioned that because although circumcision is a relatively common and straightforward um, operation. A lot of times things can go wrong. Sometimes you can take too much skin or too little skin. Um, very commonly, you may have bleeding um, after the procedure is done. Um, if, if the bleeding is not stopped carefully at the time of surgery. So it's not an operation to be taken lightly. It's something right. that it's an operation that should be done by someone who does have uh, you know, a fair number of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, erectile function, I don't want to say dysfunction. Can there be a dysfunction at any age or mm -hmm. it's only persons in later um, age groups? No. So erectile dysfunction can occur at any age. Although, um, given the common causes of erectile dysfunction, it's usually associated with men who are older. But there are congenital causes, meaning causes that you can be born with, that may cause impairment of the blood flow into the penis or cause impairment of the nerve supply. So there are rare Thankfully, they are not common, but there are, or you can, may have hormonal factors that can um, cause, um, that can affect um, a man getting an erection. Or very commonly, especially in our population, where sickle cell um, disease is not uncommon, you may have men who develop what is known as priapism, which is a prolonged, usually painful erection. And if that is not dealt with um, carefully and quickly, expeditiously, they can develop scarring in the penis. In other words, the penis will heal with fibrosis, 
and they may never be able to get an erection again, and that can occur okay. in young men. So, so you're, what you're saying, in effect, is that anything, anything that they're seeing outside of the norm, it's, it's best to deal with it immediately and not try to self-medicate by taking small doses or full doses of Viagra, which we are hearing that young men are, I mean, they, not, they don't really need it, but they think they need it for longevity as well as, you know, strength, I suppose. But you find that very young men are using um, assistance aids, whether it's shiny brush or Viagra or Cialis or whatever. We are hearing that younger men are taking these pills. What do you say to men, young men, who see it necessary or think it is hip to take these tablets or these liquids? Well, yeah. Well, in some instances, some of these men may have a genuine problem. And if they do have a genuine problem, they should really seek medical attention and not self-medicate. Self right? yeah, one of the reasons why men may use Viagra is because it is known to shorten what is known as a refractory period. The refractory period is that time or that period following ejaculation um, before a man can get another erection with arousal. Yes. When you're relatively, when you're young, when you're in your teenage years and, and young adult years, that time is relatively short. So there are men who may be accustomed to having sex on more than one occasion in a short period. But from the early 30s onwards, the refractory period um, naturally starts to lengthen. And so men may suddenly find that they're not able to have sex two times or three times in a short period like they used to because that refractory period is no longer. Um, Viagra is known to shorten the refractory period. So some men, young men, may use it for that reason. It's not that they have a problem because that issue of a lengthening refractory period is a physiological or naturally occurring problem or naturally occurring phenomenon, rather, that occurs with, with aging. So my general advice to men would be, if you're having an issue getting, an, an, getting or maintaining an erection, is that you sh really should see a medical doctor. Okay, great. So the young men self-medicate. The older men self-medicate because they have more than one partners. What do you have to say on this very, because many men think it's a rite of passage. Um, we have heard the saying, one, one woman kill cock. We have heard the saying, um, they can't, they, they are made hunters and so forth and so on. What would your advice be in this case, in, in, in this what, to this type of mentality, this type of thinking? Well, again, Sandra, over the years, I've seen uh, many men who have come um, to me for erectile dysfunction, and they have what is known as situational erectile dysfunction, meaning that they find it difficult to get an erection with their regular long-term partner, their partner that they have been with for a long time but they have an outside partner who they do not have an issue getting an erection with. Um, and that's, that statement that you made earlier um, is what that refers to, where you, you have a situational erectile dysfunction because the familiarity and the lack of novelty um, with a long-term partner is gone, whereas the novelty and, 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 and excitement with an outside partner causes a man to be able to have an erection more easily. Now, Viagra is not the solution to that problem. If somebody is concerned about their marriage and wants it to work, for example, or the relationship with their long-term partner, what they need to do is seek um, counseling from a marital counselor or a sexual um, counselor who can 
help them find ways of revitalizing um, you know, the, the, the sexual relationship within their but marriage. Talk, you know, you're talking to Jamaican men, right? Most, well, well we're know, focusing on the Jamaican sure. population right now. But I, I mean, in general, as yeah. you know, when, when you say doctor and when you say counseling, it's like you're cursing a bad word. Right. Well, you know, so, so the reality is, yes, men do have outside partners. And as I mentioned, um, situational erectile dysfunction is a real issue. Um, and if, you, if you're really highly motivated to deal with that, then finding exciting ways um, of, of having sexual relations with your long-term partner is certainly one of the ways of dealing with that, going on a holiday, wearing sexy lingerie. Some women also may have gained weight and, may, and their husbands may no longer find them sexually attractive. That, that sometimes is an issue. Um, and, and so this is why I say um, is in a situation like that, it's best for the man and woman to, to seek counseling um, together. Now, where it relates to the men going outside, and needing um, Viagra and other um, medical yes, to help them. That is, that is um, quite common for the simple reason that as you get older, as I mentioned, the refractory period lengthens. And if you are sexually satisfying your wife at home and have to be satisfying someone outside as well, as, as you get older, that places more demands on your body. And as we mentioned, men do not readily um, get an erection um, in, a, in a shorter while as they get older. And so men do commonly use, um, you know, what we call PDE5 inhibitors. That's a generic, that's the name of the class of drugs, such as, you know, such as Viagra and Levitra and Cialis, to help them to get an erection in, in those situations. What about the man being overweight or what we like to call girth? His stomach is high. Is there any correlation to a large stomach? Because that, that, I've heard that. Can you just um, let us um, give, give us your feedback on that? What is the yes, fact well, on know. that, I should say? Yes, well, I'm sure we've all heard that the, the larger the organ, the larger the tool shedder or something to that effect. <laughs> Yes. But, but, the truth, but, but the truth is that um, one of the most dangerous things to a man's health is what we call centripetal obesity or weight gain around the waist. Because that gaining weight around the waist um, causes a number of deleterious effects on the body. Um, you, a man develops what is known as insulin resistance. So he has a tendency to develop diabetes. Um, so in many cases, these men are either what we call pre-diabetic or frankly diabetic. And diabetes affects the blood vessels and the nerves that supply the penis. Right. Also, also, these men very commonly have what is known as a metabolic syndrome, uh, where they have a combination of high blood pressure the lipids such as the cholesterol and other things in the in the fats in the blood are 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 abnormally high. As I mentioned, their blood pressure is, is sometimes high. They are pre-diabetic or frankly diabetic, and they may be developing heart disease. And a lot of these men have what is known as atherosclerosis, where the blood vessels are being affected by a deposit, by inflammatory processes and deposits of fat. Moreover, as the fat in the, around the waist accumulates, that fat does two things. It converts testosterone to estrogen. So wow. men who have... I've men never who heard have that a, before, Doc. Apart from yes. today when you mentioned it to me. Yeah, there is what is known as aromatization. So that, that fat in the, in the abdomen converts the testosterone that they have into estrogen. So they have a relatively higher um, concentration of female hormones compared to wow. male hormones. And so that inhibits 
their erectile function. But even more importantly, that fat secretes a, a, that fat secretes a, a, a substance that adversely affects the pituitary gland. And you know, the pituitary gland is called the master gland of the where body. Do we find, where do you find that, Doc? It's in the, in the brain. So it's at the okay. base of the brain. Mm -hmm. So that pituitary gland, which is called the master gland in the body, is adversely affected by this large deposit of fat in, the, in and around the gut and around the waist. And so the combination of all those effects causes a man to have poor erectile function. Not only does he have poor erectile function, but he may notice that his libido or his interest and desire for sex decreases. Um, he may also notice that he has less early morning erections. Early morning and nighttime erections are a very good barometer for a man's testosterone level. If the testosterone levels are low or declining, a man will notice that he is not having early morning or nighttime erections as frequently as he used to. So those, those symptoms, the lack of early morning and nighttime erections, the lack of an interest and desire for sex, and finally erectile dysfunction, having an inability to either get or maintain an erection, those are commonly associated with a large gut. And when it reaches to the level of 102 centimeters or approximately 40 inches, that is considered very dangerous. Wow. Because, that, because at, that, at that point, then you're likely to, to have a, you know, the diabetes, the high blood pressure, the heart disease. And remember, you know, as I said earlier, the, what is happening in the penis is a reflection of what is happening in the in the, in the body. body. So when a man comes to me with erectile dysfunction, we look for all those things. We ask about cigarette smoking, we ask about diabetes, we ask about um, his lipids or cholesterol and triglycerides. We measure those things. We, we determine if he has high blood pressure. Um, and we try to correct all of those things. If he's overweight, we try to correct that and, and refer him to a dietitian and put him on an exercise program. If his cardiologist or, or general practitioner says it's safe to begin an exercise program. So it's a comprehensive or holistic approach to erectile dysfunction. It's not just simply um, giving a tablet or, or an injection because um many times the poor penile health um, is an indicator of poor heart health and um, or poor cardiovascular health rather and uh, many of these men there are many studies that have shown that if a man has severe erectile dysfunction within a matter of 10 years a large um, minority of them will go on to have heart attacks and strokes and so on so it's it's a it's an important opportunity for the doctor to make a difference in the overall health of the patient when the man comes complaining of erectile dysfunction. That cannot be emphasized enough. So, Doc, so let us talk to the, the person, because we're not, I'm not going to assume that it's the woman that are doing the cooking in the kitchen, right? So let us just talk a little bit about diet and how we can balance that, especially what are some of the foods that men should really eat to have that level of um, testosterone in their body, to maintain that level of testosterone, to, 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 to maintain that healthy lifestyle. I know, I know men and women, we, we, we put on weight in different areas and we, 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 are, are, we get, I think women put on weight easier, they say, right? than men if I if I'm not if I'm not um if I'm correct and we put it on in different areas. Can you just speak a little bit about um what the men need to focus on in terms of eating and exercise? Okay, so that diet and exercise are extremely important and it cannot be overemphasized. Um, so let me start first with that. A diet that is 
rich in saturated fats or animal fats and a diet in which your your intake of calories exceeds your energy output in other words you're taking in more than what you need over a, a long period will cause you to gain weight and as you get older your metabolic rate decreases so if you continue eating the same amount that you did when you were young, you will naturally put on weight because one of the things that happens as we get older is that there is a decline in our, in our level of metabolism or metabolic rate. So your caloric intake, your overall caloric intake has to balance your, your energy needs. Now, if you are a very active person, if you are very active, meaning that you you go to the gym, you exercise, you, your job involves a lot of physical activity, then obviously you will need um, to eat more food because food is energy. That's right. where you get your energy from. If you have a sedentary job, a desk job, um, then you need to match what you are, you are taking in with what your energy output is. And so for the, your energy, the energy needs of an individual varies significantly based on the type of job they have, the physical activities that they engage in, their age and their sex. Um, so that's a general guideline. Now, in terms of specifics as what person should be eating, as I mentioned, saturated fats, the, 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 the fat that you get from, in, from animal meat, is, co is generally considered unhealthy because it, 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 tends to, it tends to increase their risk um, of, of um, this, what we call dyslipidemia, meaning high cholesterol and, and triglycerides in the blood, and that causes a laying down of, of, of fats in the blood vessels, causing the blood vessels to narrow. It also increases the inflammation of the blood vessels. So if you're eating a lot of animal fat, it causes the internal lining of the blood vessels to become inflamed. Cigarette smoking also does that, or a lack of exercise also causes the blood vessels to become inflamed. And if the blood vessels get inflamed, you have decreased function. So the blood vessels secrete um, a very important molecule called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is the key molecule in terms of cardiovascular health generally and erectile function specifically because it is nitric oxide that is released by the blood vessels and the ends of the nerve nerve endings in the penis that causes a whole cascade of effects to occur where there is increased blood flow into the penis as well as decreased outflow of blood so if a man is having a diet that is causing him to have a lot of inflammation of his blood vessels, so if you're eating a lot of animal fat, you're eating a lot of sugars, so you're, you're, you're eating a lot of sugary and sweet drinks, you're eating a lot of animal fat, you're not getting enough, enough exercise, you're smoking, then all of these things can cause inflammation of the blood vessels, causing less generation of nitric oxide, less ability of the blood vessels to relax and open up and also um, physical narrowing of your blood vessels over a long period okay so so lean meat so you should cut off the obvious fat of 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 meat so lean portions of meat um generally you should eat no more than the size of the palm of your hand at any one meal in terms of portion sizes of meat. Um, you should be eating a wide variety of different colored fruits and vegetables. At least, they say at least five servings a day is what is recommended. And these servings should include, as I said, different colors and varieties of fruits and vegetables. You should be drinking enough water to keep your kidneys functioning well. Um, at least it, de it depends. And you know, there is no hard and fast rule as to how many glasses of water you should drink per day. Um, it depends on what the, 
where you live and what sort of physical activities you're engaged in. But I would say a minimum of five glasses is 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 is, is important. What about or, alcoholic beverages? So in moderation, I would say in moderation. Um, alcohol in moderation. There are recent studies that have suggested that no level of alcohol intake is good. But um, these, these, um, there are some older studies which suggest that very um, low levels of alcohol intake actually increases your, your good cholesterol. There are two types of cholesterol in the blood. There is a, what is known as the LDL cholesterol, which is a bad, bad cholesterol, and the HDL cholesterol which is a good cholesterol, which protects men against heart attacks, strokes, and erectile dysfunction. So having one or two glasses of, of wine per day may be good, may be a good thing in terms of increasing your HDL. Other things that do it includes exercise, getting enough um, aerobic exercise each day, you know, walking, jogging, skipping, swimming, cycling, Anything that increases your heart rate consistently for a minimum of a half an hour, done three or four times a week, um, would um, be good in terms of increasing the levels of your good cholesterol in the blood, as well as increase improving the, your cardiovascular, uh, overall cardiovascular health and penile health. Okay. So let's talk about a, a little about um, sperm count. Some men have what you call low sperm count, or what they call low sperm count. Um, how can one avoid this, or is it avoidable? Or we, we hear that tight, keeping the, 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 the scrotum cool, or prevent, um, stop wearing tight jeans or tight pants also helps. Um, what do you have to say about um, Okay, so a, a, a low, low sperm, sperm, sperm count. A, a low sperm count. So this is unrelated to penile health, but generally speaking, a low sperm count can be caused by a, a myriad of things. Um, generally speaking, um, studies have shown that there has been a general decline in sperm counts over the last several decades. Um, so yes, when you when you do surveys of healthy, so-called healthy men. Um, there has been a general decline in sperm counts over the last few decades. And this is thought to be due to more because there are more estrogens in the environment. Um, things like plastics and cosmetics and perfumes and all of these things are, are, are weakly estrogenic compounds. And chronic exposure to these estrogenic compounds is thought to account for the decline in sperm counts, generally speaking, that have been occurring over the last several decades. Specifically, though, in an individual man, what could cause a low sperm count? Well, the fact is it can be caused by a number of things. The, for, the, for the testicle, the testicle, which is the, the, the seeds, and, and, or what we call the seed, that's the origin of, of, of the sperm cells. Um, and for sperm production to take place, the, the temperature, for example, the temperature of the scrotum needs to be at a, at a lower temperature than the rest of the body. And this is why um, it is felt that God placed us placed uh, um, the testes in, in what is called the scrotum because it is separate and apart from the rest of the body. So anything that causes the temperature of the scrotum to increase um, is one of the things that can adversely affect your sperm count. So men, it is true that men who wear tight-fitting underwear, um, men who work in hot environments such as a kitchen, or other hot environments, their sperm count may be adversely affected. There are many other environmental toxins, however, that may adversely affect your sperm count. So marijuana smoking, so ganja, can adversely affect your sperm count. Um, toxins in the environment, pesticides, um, environmental 
um, pesticides can affect adversely affect your sperm count. Um, diseases that affect you in during young adulthood, so things like mumps and other viral infections that can affect the testicles, can affect your sperm count as well. Um, and then there are congenital, there are conditions that a man can be born with that would either lead to either a low sperm count or absent sperm altogether. And, and things then, like, things like, let me just um, finish. So things like chemotherapy and radiation can also affect your sperm count. Very commonly though, very commonly, um, the most common cause of a low sperm count is what we call a varicocele. A varicocele is, you know, it's a similar condition to when women have varicose veins. Mm -hmm. So there are some veins called the pampiniform plexus of veins that drain the testicles. If these veins become dilated and tortuous, um, just like varicose veins in the leg, if they become dilated and tortured and the blood from the testicle isn't draining well, then what happens is the temperature in the testicles rise and other, other things happen in the testicle as well. They have a more um, inflammatory products being retained. And because of this, the production of sperm by the testicle is adversely affected. So men with this condition called a varicocele um, very commonly present with a low sperm count. They may present in other ways, such as pain in the testicle, um, but a low sperm count is a um, failure to have a child after one year of trying mm -hmm. is one of the common ways that in which they present. Okay, so is there any test or would a man only know about this low sperm count when he's ready to have a child or there is some test that he can do um, to find out their status of some kind? Um, is there anything, I mean, let's say I had mumps when I was young as a, as a man. Is there a test that can be done before I'm, I'm ready to have children to find out if I am able to have children or, you know, can you say a little on, on that? Yes, so there is a simple um, laboratory test called a semen analysis. Mm -hmm. A semen analysis is a simple test where um, it is done usually at the lab or it may be done in the man's home, in the privacy of his home. It is preferably done in the lab though and it is simply involves a man masturbating and producing a sample of semen in a wide mouth jar and it is best done after abstaining from ejaculating for at least two to three days so if a semen analysis is going to be done the man should abstain from ejaculating for two to three days and it should be done preferably in the lab so and the reason for this is that the specimen needs to be examined right away it needs to be examined within the hour um, because the sperm cells die rapidly and their movement is affected um, by, 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 by the, you know, the, the container. So it needs to be done quickly. And so it's preferably done at the lab. Now, most men, I would say the vast majority of men um, realize they have a low sperm count when um, after a year of trying to father a child, they find that it's not happening. Typically, the woman will be evaluated first and then the gynecologist may refer the man to the to the urologist for further evaluation. But yes, um, if a man has a condition that he thinks may have affected his fertility, he can preemptively do a semen analysis prior to um, attempting to start a family. Yeah. Oh, excellent information, Doc. Okay, so since we're done at the scrotum, can you just touch now? on um, the, the biggie, which most men are af afraid to go and get their tests. I just want you to just basically talk about the age that men should start getting their prostate examination. What types of um, examinations are there and do they have to do the, the digital examin examination? And, um, you know, 
how can can it be prevented in any way, shape, or form? Sure. So we live in a very high risk society where prostate cancer is concerned. Prostate cancer is the by far the leading cause of cancer deaths in men, by far. Um, and so we live in a society in which um, a lot of men die unnecessarily from prostate cancer. So death from prostate cancer is something that can be prevented. We may not be able to prevent a diagnosis of prostate cancer, but what we can definitely prevent is a man dying from prostate cancer. And the way to prevent any man dying from prostate cancer is for the cancer to be detected early enough. Um, and we recommend in this high risk, high prevalence society um, that a man, as soon as he reaches the age of 40 years um, on a yearly basis, avails himself of the, of the test um, to screen for prostate cancer. These uh, just a second, Doc. If, if he had it in his family, let's say his close relative, his father, his grandfather, his brother had it, do, 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 does he need to screen any earlier or 40 is still fine? No, no. He doesn't need to screen earlier. 40 is the age for a high-risk population or someone who has a family history. So, for example, if you're Caucasian, if you're Caucasian and you don't have a family history and you live in a in a in a, a low risk population, then age 50 or 55, as a matter of fact, is the age that it is recommended to start screening. Okay. But in our high risk population, um, 40 um, is the age that we recommend. Um, bear in mind that. Um, being of African descent puts a man at high risk for prostate cancer. Also, having a family history, not only of prostate cancer, but if there is a family history of breast cancer. So the sons of, of women who have had breast cancer or the brothers of women who have had breast cancer are at high risk. Up. Oh, yes. They are, they are at higher risk of getting prostate cancer. In fact, it's not only breast cancer also endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer so if you are the if you are the son or the brother of a woman who has had breast cancer endometrial cancer which is cancer of the womb or or of or, 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 or ovarian cancer cancer of the ovary then you are at higher risk of getting prostate cancer and you should also start at age 40. Um, not many people are aware of this. This is relatively Did new information. That. And this is due to the BRCA gene, the same gene that caused Angelina Jolie to do her prophylactic mastectomies. Right. That same gene, that same gene, the BRCA gene, increases a man's risk of, of prostate cancer as well. Are there any signs, what are the signs and symptoms of prostate cancer? And if, if if you are having signs and symptoms, does that mean you are already in action? I mean, late stage, or you still can catch it early if you are having symptoms? All right. So early, early prostate cancer does not cause any symptoms, generally speaking. So one of the reasons why we strongly urge men to screen at age 40, and by definition, screening involves doing a test when you do not have any symptoms. The right. reason we advocate that is because if a man waits until he has symptoms, then the cancer typically is locally advanced or it may already have metastasized or spread. So symptoms is not a good thing to wait for, um, for prostate cancer, because if you have symptoms, then it more than likely means that the cancer may have already spread or at least be locally advanced. Um, these symptoms that a man may have, which we are saying you shouldn't wait until you get them, are symptoms that are also seen when a man has an enlarged prostate due to benign or non-cancerous enlargement. So you can have a, an enlarged prostate and it's not cancerous? Correct. In fact, in fact, 
there is a condition that all men will get called benign prostatic hyperplasia or BPH for short, in which at a, at, at a minimum, there are changes that will take place in your prostate um, indicating that BPH is present. And in a significant majority of men, they will actually have some degree of enlargement of the prostate. And some of these men will then go on to have symptoms um, because the urine passage passes right through the middle of the prostate. And as the prostate enlarges, um, and as the smooth muscle, the muscle within the prostate becomes reactive with the enlargement, these men may get symptoms such as getting up frequently at night to pass urine. They may not be able to hold their urine. They may notice when they go to the bathroom, it takes a while before the urine starts to flow. And when the urine does come, it comes out in a weak or poor um, urinary stream. Um, they may actually notice that the urine is dribbling. They may sometimes strain to pass urine or the urine may come out in an interrupted flow meaning it doesn't flow continuously, but it flows and stops um, and continues doing so until the end. And they may dribble towards the end. And finally, they may feel that when they're finished passing urine, that they feel as though urine is left behind. So those are the symptoms of an enlarged prostate, um, which may also occur in advanced prostate cancer, right? now. Th those two conditions, BPH and prostate cancer, affect the same age group of men. So commonly when men come to us with those symptoms, it's due to BPH and not due to cancer. Right. Although, during, although during the process of evaluating these men with the rectal examination, the digital rectal examination and the blood is test. Is there any other way to do the test, doc, without the digital, doc? Because you know that is the fear of the men. Right. So these men, when they have the digital rectal examination and the blood test, the prostate-specific antigen blood test, they may, be, they may be found to have a coexisting cancer. So to answer your question, Sandra, it is still recommended that the two tests be done together because they are complementary tests, meaning that a man may have a normal blood test, and when you examine him, he may have a nodule, a hard nodule in his prostate, indicating that prostate cancer is there. Um, now, to be honest, that is not a very common scenario, but it does occur. And so the recommendation is that men should have both the rectal exam and the, and the blood test. However, if a man insists that he only wants to have the blood test alone, we will, we will do the blood test alone. We're not going to force anybody um, to do a test that they don't want to do. Okay, boy, Doc, that's a lot of information. I, I really learned a lot tonight. I have um, two questions. It says, so I'm um, going to a sauna or hot tubs. Um, it causes the, the testicles to be hot. Does that affect, does that affect the, the, the sperm in any way? Or as you come out of the sauna, it cools down so it doesn't really affect you? So if a man over a long period of time, repeatedly and chronically, um, and with, with frequency and regularity goes to a sauna, then yes, it can adversely affect his sperm count. So in other words, if it is something he's doing on a very frequent and regular basis, then what yes. Is frequent? Could Once a week, twice a week? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Everybody really... frequencies is mean something different to them frequent yeah, like good, what, once a week that's a good question sandra I, I you know i i don't know that there's any study that yes. would specifically um address how frequent is frequent yes. but i think common sense would need to be used here as as well as everything ought to be done in moderation moderation right so, you know, I, I would not recommend a man to be having a, a sauna more than twice in a month. Okay. I, 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 really, I really would not recommend that. Yeah, that's, but weight, that is, weight training, does it increase testosterone? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, <laughs> okay. One of our so viewers what we, asked. So what we do know 
is that testosterone is very, very important for maintaining lean muscle mass. Testosterone is the hormone that maintains a man's lean muscle mass. We know that, as I mentioned earlier, when a man allows his abdomen to become obese, then with the, with the large accumulation of fat, then that in and of itself causes a low, lower testosterone. Now the question is, is it the chicken or the egg? Because sometimes, because of a low testosterone, as a causative agent, a man may accumulate a lot of fat around his waist. Because as we said earlier, testosterone is a hormone that maintains lean muscle mass. So in some cases, a man may have a low testosterone and develop a lot of fat around, around the waist and in other parts of the body. But to answer the question specifically, I'm not aware of a study that specifically says or has shown that building muscle will increase your testosterone level. Having a, a, having a normal testosterone level will make it easier for you to build muscle. And muscle burns more energy than fat. So when you accumulate more muscle, your metabolic rate increases. So at rest, you are burning more calories. So somebody who has built, who has more muscle mass, mm -hmm. um, mass for mass or gram for gram compared to somebody else who has less muscle, they are constantly burning more energy. So yes. they will be able to maintain a, 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 a leaner, um, leaner physique compared to somebody who has less muscle. So I know that's a long-winded answer, mm -hmm. but the, 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 the interaction or the interrelationship between testosterone and muscle is, is not a simple one. Okay. All right. Um, this question, can a man's penis cause a woman to have continuous yeast infection? And can a woman be allergic to a man's sperm that, cause, that causes inside the woman to have yeast infection symptoms? Yes, yeah, so, so yes. So for example, a man who is uncircumcised, a man who is uncircumcised and who does not practice good hygiene, and as a consequence of not practicing good hygiene has had a, and by, let, let us be clear, by not practicing good hygiene, I mean not protracting the foreskin daily and okay. cleaning it thoroughly with soap and water. Or a man who has a tight foreskin and by virtue of the foreskin being tight is unable to retract it and clean it. In those two cases, there can be a buildup of all manner of germs, including yeast. And a man like that who is having sex can, that, that can predispose to recurrent yeast infections in the female partner. Not only yeast infections, but as I mentioned earlier, human papilloma virus, that's a, that's a perfect breeding site for HPV. And a man who is uncircumcised and not practicing good hygiene um, puts his partner at risk of, of cervical cancer as well. What was the second part of that question, um, Sandra? Um, inside, can a woman be allergic to a man's sperm? Yes. So there are cases where... Really? Where, yes, there are oh. cases, um, and the gynecologist would be more au fait with this, but there are cases where specifically... Um, a woman has been allergic to a specific partner's sperm, not just any man's sperm, okay. but the sperm of a particular um, specific partner. So yes, that can occur, but thankfully that is not a very common um, condition. Is, is, is erectile dysfunction inevitable? No. <laughs> so you can no, have I've sex until 90? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so erectile dysfunction is not inevitable. Erectile dysfunction, yes, it is associated with age, but it is not caused by age. And let me explain what I mean. So many of the 
um, factors that are associated with age that cause not only erectile dysfunction, but cardiovascular disease or lifestyle related factors. And these include um, sedentary, a sedentary lifestyle, so not getting enough um, physical activity, um, cigarette smoking, having uncontrolled high blood pressure, um, diabetes, mellitus, um, dyslipidemia, that is having high cholesterol or, or, or um, triglycerides in the blood, which are in turn related to having a bad diet or not maintaining um, your ideal body weight, um, having a stressful um, lifestyle. So if you're chronically exposed to stress and you do not manage it by making sure that you actively engage in stress reduction techniques, such as getting a massage at Totally Male on a regular basis. <laughs> Back to that and, blog. <laughs> and, and other stress redu reducing techniques, you know. Then over a chronic period of time, your blood vessels will undergo what is called atherosclerosis. Um, and the blood vessels will narrow. Not only do they physically narrow, but because of the high, um, high inflammatory um, states that the internal lining of the blood vessels are exposed to because of the high fat diet, the lack of exercise, the cigarette smoking and so on, then it doesn't secrete enough nitric oxide as we mentioned earlier. Nitric oxide, as I mentioned, critically important molecule um, that is um, important for cardiovascular health. So to answer the question, um, so simply, no. A man, if, if you maintain um, a healthy lifestyle by getting enough physical activity, eating right, avoiding those things that will cause your blood vessels to malfunction and narrow, um, if you do all of those things, then it is quite possible to maintain good erectile health and overall cardiovascular health. Um, well into your old age wow. um it's important. That, that 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 that's impressive doc what i want to find out from you though let's say i am into my six up to say in my 50s um obese or heavy and i said okay i uh i i i i i decided no more do everything lose the weight can my situation be reversed absolutely there are many many studies that have been done well conducted robust studies that have shown that um just simply going on a regular consistent aerobic exercise program that increases your your cardiovascular health will improve your erectile function. That has been well shown within a short while too. You don't have to necessarily wait until the, 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 the obesity and the weight is lost. Within a, very, within a relatively short time of beginning an exercise program, um, it is possible to see um, positive changes in erectile function. Now, let me be clear, this won't necessarily happen in every man. Because for some men who have been long-standing diabetics, um, no pun intended. Smoked. Long standing. <laughs> <laughs> right, no pun intended. No pun intended. But but for some men, um, the changes would have been um, severe, and there would have been structural changes that would have taken place that are Damage difficult, nine impossible to reverse. So for those men. Um, Drugs such as um, Levitra, Cialis, and Viagra, and the generics to them may help. If those don't work, then we can teach men other methods. We can teach them to inject themselves with a with with a with a um, agent that is very effective in giving an erection for men who don't like the concept or the oh, idea oh, of oh, it. Because I'm learning here. You're saying that there's an injection if Cialis 
or any of those um, oral um, tablets don't work, there's an injection that can give you an erection? Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we regularly prescribe this. So okay. there's that an injection. for just one time or it's it's something that you take on a continuous basis? So this is prescribed for men who have severe erectile dysfunction and for which it, the tablets have not worked. Um, we the, the name of the agent is Trimix. Um, it's an agent that is regularly prescribed by us, um, us meaning urologists. Um, it is readily available locally. We, we determine the correct dose of the Trimix to that needs to be injected because if you inject too high a dose then the man will have an erection that will last too long be, wow. uh, uh, beyond beyond um sexual intercourse and an erection that lasts too long will become painful and will cause um severe problems so we in office we determine the correct dose of the trimix to be prescribed we teach a man how to give the injection or we teach his partner. If the man doesn't want to give the injection, we teach his partner. Now, what men may find is that, these remember, Sandra, these are men who have not been having an erection in a long time. Yeah. So after they've been using the erection, after they've been using the injection for a while, some men do notice a natural improvement in the erections because something that we didn't emphasize earlier. It is said, if you don't use it, you lose it. And there right. is some truth. There is some truth to that. In that, the nighttime erections that a man gets, um, which was said was related to testosterone. During the nighttime and early morning when a man gets those erections, that is bringing increasing blood flow into the penis with increasing oxygen, and other nutrients that maintains the health and viability of the penis. Yes. If a man is not having regular erections, what happens is that the penis tends to shrink. And the... What? Yes. Yes. The penis tends to shrink oh. because the penis is not getting enough oxygen. It's not getting enough nutrients from the blood to maintain the health and vitality of the penis. So the functional tissue of the penis will shrink and it will be replaced by a lot of scar tissue or collagen tissue. So as a man starts injecting and starts getting erections, the vitality and health of the penis will, will improve naturally. Well, not naturally, but it will improve. And the man may find that the dose that is required to get an erection will decrease or he may find that he may no longer need the injections. He may go back to a situation where the tablets are now helping, um, helping him. So the, the, the answer to your question is that typically men will start off using this at, at, you know, maybe twice a week to get an erection, but they may notice that um, they may need to use it less often to get us a spontaneous erection or an, or an erection that is um, induced with the help of Viagra or Levitra or Cialis. One thing we, I, don't, I don't believe we touched on it, Doc. Sometimes because they're having um, erectile dysfunction, after a while, it's not necessarily a physical problem. After a while, it becomes a mental problem because he's nervous, he's approaching a woman, he's not sure if he's going to get up, you know, so he panics so that even becomes more burdensome how can one manage that mental state yes sandra so that's a very important question um so there are a number of issues that happens when a man has erectile dysfunction and, and we didn't touch early on the many causes of erectile dysfunction and psychological issues are account for about 15% of cases. And there is what is known as a psychological overlay um, when a man has an inability to get an erection. And it only needs to happen one time. Um, if a man um, fails to perform on at even one occasion, there is going to be 
what is called performance anxiety related to getting an erection in a subsequent on a subsequent occasion. Mm -hmm. Now, anxiety is something that occurs when you're facing a potentially threatening situation. And in the body, what is called the fight or flight response occurs. You're getting ready to fight or to flee. And, and what happens, the body starts to, the nervous system starts to pump out adrenaline and another hormone called noradrenaline. And this adrenaline and noradrenaline, which a man may not quite frankly be aware of, Mm -hmm. causes the erections, causes the blood vessels to constrict or shut down, close down. Mm -hmm. So this performance anxiety, which is a psychological overlay um, of, not, of not having been able to perform on a previous occasion, causes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It causes a self-fulfilling prophecy because it, 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 the anxiety causes the release of these hormones and these hormones shut down the blood vessels and prevent an erection occurring. So very commonly when we treat an erection- But there's something physically happens. It's, 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 his brain says, no, we're not gonna yeah. happen, and it just shuts down. Yes, the, the, the okay. anxiety, the anxiety so it's not causes, just the brain. Well, everything is caused by the brain. In fact, the brain is the most important sex organ there is. Everything originates in the brain, <laughs> really. So um, when a man says, Doc, I'm not really into her, it's just sex, was that, what does that mean then? The, the brain um, has to get engaged. Yeah, it means, well, it means exactly that. When a man says that, he means he, he might be physically attracted to the, to, to the woman and he may... Um, he may be pursuing her because he wants sex and nothing else. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean that the brain is not engaged. If the brain is not engaged, the man won't be able to have an erection. Okay. Um, having, said that, having said that, there are two broad types of erections. There is what is called a psychogenic erection. You know, in, in, in young men, just the sight or, or thought of uh, sexually, um, attractive woman will cause an erection. Um, that tends to occur less and less as a man gets older. As a man gets older, he needs more direct physical stimulation, stimulation of the penis to get an erection, and that's yeah. called a reflexogenic erection. And that may not necessarily engage the brain. In other words, that may occur at, at a lower level in the nervous system. Mm -hmm. But generally, the two augment each other. And so, generally speaking, in an erection, there is both um, a psychogenic component as well as a reflex component. Okay. Well, we have two more questions and we still have to wrap up because, you know, so it's almost an hour and a half, Doc. All right. So, um, this question says, is it recommended to do routine medical slash physical that includes genitorinary assessment or should that be only if an issue is suspected no so from the moment a man reaches the age of 35 or 40 and and, and again it also depends on knowing your family history um we spoke earlier about family history and prostate cancer and we said that age 40 is the age that is recommended to start screening but generally, as we get older, a whole host of issues may start happening. And I would recommend that in terms of routine physicals, what we call an executive profile or a professional panel, where you see your general practitioner yearly and you have a battery or series of tests done um, to determine whether you are healthy. I would recommend age 35 um, that a man starts doing that from age 35. Now, not all tests may be necessary at that age. For example, the tests on your prostate, we do not recommend starting that at age 35, but certainly things like checking for diabetes, checking for high blood pressure, 
um, checking your cholesterol level, those things, checking your weight, those things are things that I would recommend that you start at age 35. So the answer is yes, a, a man should start having routine tests done at age 35, general health checks done at age 35 to maintain yourself. And not just not just his general, um, not just those general checks, but even things like dental checkups and your eyes, those are things that you know you should routinely start checking at age 35. On boy, one. Doc, this has been boy and such an enlightening program. Um, I'm sure everybody learned so much as I know I learned a whole lot. We may have to invite you again because I'm sure there are going to be a lot of questions. But where can we find you? Um, where are you? Um, if someone needs to come and have a conversation with you, if if a woman wants to come to speak to you about um, her husband, if he doesn't want to come, you know, to try and encourage him to come to see you, where can we find you? Okay, so as I said earlier, Sandra, I'm I'm a I'm, I'm at the University of the West Indies. I'm a lecturer, senior lecturer there, and I'm a, a consultant urologist at the University Hospital. But where I consult um, privately is at a place called Island Medical Specialists, mm -hmm. which is at the top of Mountain View. Um, the address is 2A Beverly Vale Close. Um, it, it's right at the top of Mountain View, just... Um, just before you get to the gas station, the newly yep. re renovated yep. gas station. Um, you remember I the also, number? Um, yes, it's nine two seven. It's nine two seven three zero four nine. I also see patients at the Jamaica Cancer Society, and as you know, the Jamaica Cancer Society, um, which is currently closed because of COVID nineteen, but um, during regular operations. Um, patients can see me there specifically for prostate cancer screening. Um, unfortunately, in those circumstances, we can't entertain a long discussion on other matters. But in terms of prostate cancer screening, I do see men at the Cancer Society where they get my services um, free of cost. We don't charge, um, the urologists don't charge for those services. Okay. Um, the I didn't know so, that. Right, they, they do pay a nominal fee to the cancer society. Okay, okay. But the, but the urologists, including myself, offer our services free there for prostate enough. cancer screening. Right. So for private consultation, I'm at Island Medical Specialist. Do they need to be referred to you or can they come straight to you? Absolutely not. Most of my patients actually are self-referred. Um, men, do not, men do not need to have a referral to come and see me. However, I, you know, I am a urologist, so I, I don't treat general medical conditions. Right. I treat those conditions that are related to the genital urinary system. So anything related to genital health in men, um, so anything related to the testicles, the scrotum, the penis, um, anything related to male infertility, erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation, um, anything related to the urinary system, whether in men or women. A lot of women see me for urinary tract problems. So anything related to the urinary tract, whether it's recurrent urinary tract infections, kidney stones, or any cancers related to the urinary tract, um, that's what a urologist um, treats. Awesome, awesome, awesome. It has been an awesome hour and a half doc and we would just want to say thank you so much and we will learn so much i mean we could go on and on and on and on because the information is invaluable i hope i sincerely hope to my facebook family that you do act on the information if there's any issues happening with you um as you as you can see um dr Akin is very knowledgeable and he has a wealth of experience and we just want to encourage you because for 2020 and beyond health we say 
So I just want to thank you for tuning in. I want you to like and share. When I post it, share it to everybody that you know, because this is very, very, very good information. And it came to you free of cost. So we just want to yes. say thank you. Yes? Yes, Dr. Yes, yes, something. Sir. Yes. Uh, well, I want to thank you for inviting me, but I also want to say there are many, many conditions of the penis we didn't get a chance to touch on. Mm -hmm. So things such as fractures of the penis, which may occur during intercourse, uh, a condition called Peyronie's disease, which has an abnormal acquired angulation of the penis. We briefly mentioned priapism. So I'd be very happy to come back for... Absolutely. Uh, I am sure I'm going to get a request to come back yes, for a part two absolutely uh, and I'm there are many, many other because we, i am we totally male is here to help all the men help because that's what we do because you know i am pushing towards um having a wellness center for men that's my dream and mm -hmm. i know i'll realize it after covid it'll be full speed ahead because i know that men are really all about convenience and once they have the 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 um access to 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 proper health care they will act and especially under my guidance i won't give up on them i will never give up on them i am here for the men of jamaica of my boys and men so i just want to say thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you for staying with us it has been an awesome um hour and a half um i next week we're going to be trying to ensure that we have this thing running you know it, we, as as every week happens we have a little technical difficulties but we'll, we'll get it straight as soon as possible thank you good night see you next week um we're looking what i would love for you to do we're thinking eight or nine o'clock could you just send us a message as to which which time you prefer because i know persons are saying because of covid 19 persons are going to bed much earlier so you can just let us know give us a little note whether you'd prefer eight or nine o'clock and next week we'll advertise the time next week we'll be, next week we'll be speaking on relationships dating in 2020 the different age groups and what is going to be required in this day and age so see you next week. Godspeed. Good night. Night, night. <laughs>